All right, welcome to composting, everybody. My name is Joanne Toms. I'm with the City of Glendale Water Services Department. Also with me tonight is Ann Staley, also with the Glendale Water Services Department, and Ryan Wood, who I will introduce in a couple more slides. So um, this is the third virtual class that we're offering this fall. So I'm super excited that we have this technology to still be able to teach uh, our residents and connect with you. So thank you for spending time uh, with us. And if this is your first Zoom webinar, I'm very proud of you. Um, this is new technology, it's fun. Um, and I think this may be our future for a while, so welcome. Okay, so webinar logistics, I just wanna let everyone know that you will be muted and the session will be recorded tonight. So we will have a PowerPoint um, presentation and that will be recorded as well. You will be able to see this presentation afterwards. Uh, it'll be on YouTube. So if you didn't catch all the notes tonight, uh, don't worry, you can go back and fast forward and rewind it um, and it'll be on YouTube. So that's exciting. You can type your real live questions and comments in the Q&A or chat functions and we will read and respond to them throughout the webinar. Uh, we'll have a Q&A section also at the end, and so Anne and I will be fielding your compost questions, garden questions, and then we'll have um, also that Q&A at the very end. It is an hour and a half uh, webinar. If you have any significant technical difficulties, please contact Anne Staley, and I'm going to read her email. If it's easier for you to email, her email is a Staley, S-T-A-H, ley at glendaleaz.com or you can call her at her landline 623-930-3550 and then we will follow up after this presentation with the powerpoint the resources recording and a link to a survey if you complete a survey after this class because we want your feedback uh, you will be entered in to win a free composting book um, so you know, that's kind of cool. We love prizes, right? So we want your feedback. What worked? What didn't work? What other topics would you like to see? So I want to go over some of the Zoom attendee features. If you're, again, not super familiar with Zoom, you will see on the bottom hand of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. You'll also see a chat. We have disabled the raise hand just so that we didn't have so many things to monitor. Um, but again, you can do your questions via chat or via Q and A. Um, and then you can adjust the uh, presentation. You can make that bigger, you can make it smaller, you can make the presenter bigger, you can make that smaller um, just with that uh, arrow right here. So you'll see those different uh, functions on your Zoom screen. And then I do want to let folks know that um, the city of Glendale has a free compost barrel. Um, it's not an official program, but the city does periodically have barrels that are sawed in half. And it's courtesy of the Glendale feed op field operations. You have to be a Glendale solid waste customer. So if you're from another city, check out your city um, to see if they have a program. And they probably do. You'd probably want to call like the sanitation department or the field ops department. Um, in Glendale, you would then request that via Glendale One, which is kind of an online service, or you can also call them at 623-930-2660. And Ryan told me he has a tip with those composters that have a lid, so I'm not going to spill it. I'll let Ryan share that. And I just want to thank Watershed Management Group. Uh, for being here. Ryan is one of my favorite presenters. I'm sorry if I'm embarrassing Ryan, but it's the truth. Um, I was telling him earlier, I just love his down-to-earth style, and he presents stuff that he's done um, in the field. So Ryan Wood shares with you his extensive, extensive knowledge in water harvesting and permaculture design, along with his skills and enthusiasm for creating sustainable livelihoods. Ryan applies his talents while educating the public through hands-on workshops, presentations, and consultations, and through integrated design services. Please welcome Ryan. I can't hear you, but that's okay. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, Ryan, and I am going to pass it on to you. All right. Thank you, Joanne. I appreciate that. And yeah, it's okay to be, a, I'm a little embarrassed, but that's all right. <laughs> No, I do. I, I, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming and joining us tonight. And, uh, you know, gosh, I miss seeing everyone's faces, but definitely, you know, 
during these times, these Zoom meetings are really just a, a good way to, to get some information um, you know, and attend these type of classes so that way you can just continue to build your knowledge on gardening and then tonight on composting. So definitely, I'm very excited to, to share my information on composting. And, and, and this is, uh, um, I got a lot of uh, stories I want to share with you too on my personal um, experiences and then definitely those questions. Um, I, I allowed, you know, got plenty of time on the end there for, um, for any questions. So, you know, be uh, asking those questions throughout the presentation. And then at the end, we'll probably have about a half hour or so, depending on how, uh, how fast we go here. So anyway, so let me go ahead and share my screen. There we go. All right. Okay, so tonight's all about composting. And uh, for composting, how to discover, how to turn your kitchen scraps and yard waste into compost, uh, which is a definitely a rich soil amendment. So that's tonight's class heading. And uh, just that photo that you're seeing there, just kind of, um, uh, that's where uh, my wife and I, it's the community garden at Scottsdale Community College. And we've been gardening out there since 2009. And uh, boy, there's some old recycle bins uh, that, uh, that we use there too. So um, definitely, uh, uh, I have that tip I'm going to share to you a little bit later about those composting bins. All right, let's get started. So tonight we're going to learn about compost and composting. What is the, uh, what's the difference between the two? Why is it good to make and use compost? So we, and then how do we make it and how do we use it? So pretty general stuff and that's really what I want you to um, take away tonight is composting can be very technical. Um, <laughs> when you break things down, there's, it's a scientific uh, process. However, composting, and to me, it's like cooking. And so you're going to find your recipe. You're going to feel what's right. And, and you're going to use the, the ingredients that you have. So um, definitely, I've, uh, I've had some experiences where it hasn't worked, and it has worked. And, so, and then the good thing is when it hasn't worked, it was a good, easy way to get it to kick started and get it working again. So with that being said, Let's get into it. So what is compost and composting? So compost uh, is basically it's the breaking down of that organic material. And the pr process of breaking down that or organic material, the decomposing part of that process, that's the composting side of it. So when you talk compost, that's your finished material. When you're talking about composting, that is the act of the compost being made. And so um, we, we are doing quite a bit of part to that, to make that compost, but there's a lot of other uh, uh, people making, or other things making that compost for you. Um, go ahead, I'm gonna just minimize one thing here. Okay, there we go. So a few things I wanna ask you, and I want you to keep in mind as we go through this presentation, is why do you wanna make compost? How are you going to make that compost? And how will you use it? Okay, so, so the big one is, why do, why do you want to make compost? How are you going to make it? And how will you use it? Okay. So why is it good to make and use compost? So it's definitely good for the environment. So when we think about all the wastes that we have in our home, that just within our own personal little environment within our homestead, those wastes, if we're not composting them, where are they going? They're going into the landfill. And if we can tap into those waste streams and compost them, then we can create that uh, soil amendment right here on site. And we're saving a lot of resources. We're saving a lot of energy. And we're saving water by doing that too. So if we can reduce the amount of um, waste that we're putting into the garbage that's then getting hauled off and sent off to the landfill that's gonna get buried and then that whole process, that's a good thing. And right off the EPA website is, they said 20% of what we throw away can be composted and they want us to do that. So when thinking about compost, it's thinking about why? It's good for my garden. It's a soil amendment. So our, our soil, especially if you're gonna be doing any vegetable gardening, will need some sort of soil amendment. And then that soil amendment, if we're making our own, it's gonna save us money that we would spend on those soil amendments. 
and fertilizers. And replacing chemical fertilizers with a compost material, uh, I personally, that's, uh, that's my wife and I's goal for our gardens, is that we could just create our own uh, fertilizers by compost and green manures and things like that. So, um, but loosens up the, our hard desert soils. So that's a good part too, because we're going, our, our desert soils texture, um, adding that organic material is gonna help build the structure of that soil. So that's gonna be good. And of course, introducing those beneficial organisms, that's a benefit because once we have a happy soil web, uh, a food web, okay, those are all the critters in the soil, then our plants are gonna be happy. So we're gonna start off with um, you know, getting those microbes in the compost and then introduce them into the soil and then feed all the soil life. So that's really good and a good reason for composting. And it improves the soil water holding capacity. Another thing here in our desert climate where gosh, we haven't spent so late on our monsoon rains. When we do get the rain, we want our soils to soak it up as much as we can in our garden so it's there for our plants. So then we don't have to use the potable irrigation as, you know, during that time. So when it does rain, soak in the soil. When we're irrigating, soak in the soil and then holds it in the soil. And that's important. So it's holding it in the soil. And then, um, which uh, as far as mulching, adding a mulch layer on top of your garden, on top of that soil surface to help hold that moisture in even more. Okay. So why the compost? Uh, if you're not using it on a garden, for example, it doesn't have to be used on a vegetable garden. You can be using compost in a, an ornamental garden. You can be spreading compost wherever plants are. And so plants are going to appreciate that compost. So why, why do you want to compost? So how to make that compost? So you need a team to make compost. You're not doing it alone. You're just providing all the things that the team needs to do the work. And so you need some shelter. You need to feed the team some food. So that's gonna be our browns and greens and the team needs to breathe. So you're gonna give it some air and the team needs to stay hydrated. So you're gonna give it some water and then simply giving it time for the team of decomposers to do their job. So the things that you need to focus on is how to create that shelter, how to create, where am I gonna put my, my compost? What resources do I have to feed the compost? And then what you need to do is you need to go out and you need to, air, you need to aerate it and you need to water it. So this is where you're building the shelter, you're, you're giving them food to eat, and then you do that you know, once a week, you go out and you care for your, your, your decomposers. You care for your team, okay? Give them the love and uh, they'll do the work for you. So let's meet that team. So this team, <laughs> breaking down your compost, there's three different levels. And that level one, the primary consumers, those are, th those are the ones that are really doing the work. And um, let's see if I get my laser pointer here. And these three bacteria, which I'll cover on the next slide, those are doing a lot of work and that depends on what the heat is in your compost. Okay, and we'll talk more about the, the heat of your compost. But definitely those level one organisms, they're gonna shred those uh, you know, organic matter. Then the other ones are gonna eat what's been shredded. So it's just breaking it down into smaller pieces. So if you can imagine bigger mouths breaking down materials so smaller mouths can eat them. And they're pooping. They're creating little tunnels and they're dying off in the compost. And that whole process is taking that material, that raw material of, of browns and greens and breaking it down into a nice uh, humus type of soil. And then the level two, now those are gonna be a little bit bigger. So those are the bigger mounds that uh, they're kind of more on the outskirts. They're not right in where the heat's at. So they're gonna be more on the outside, but they're gonna eat those level one organisms. And then you got the level three, and so definitely getting bigger, you know, your ants, your, um, uh, your earwigs, your spiders, you know, they're eating those little other smaller little bugs. And then if you take it beyond this, if you look up the, the soil food web, now we're getting into the bigger animals, right into, you know, the, the rabbits and the birds, and then, boy, you could even add us into that. So when thinking about how to build soil.
So these are the two back or the three bacteria I wanted to just to highlight on your team because depending on how hot your compost is getting is going to depend on what bacteria you have that's doing that work. And so the psychophilic bacteria, that is, um, they like a cold. So they're going to be more in that colder environment, you know, say 55 degrees. So, you know, when it's winter time and the outskirts of your pile, it's not right within the heat of it. That's where you're going to see that bacteria. The mesophilic, they love, they love that 70 to 90 degrees temperature, eh, maybe up a little bit to about 100. And they're, they're really the ones that you're going to see doing most of the work. And then once that compost heats up above 100 degrees, then your thermal loving bacteria kicks in. Okay, and that thermal bacteria is going to do well until it gets about 200 degrees, and then they're going to die off. And when that happens, your compost is going to slow down. And that's a good sign of when it's ready to turn. So your compost is going to heat up. And the reason why it's heating up, it's not because of our hot desert sun, it's because of these guys doing their work. So they're in there working away, building up that energy, and they're creating heat. And the type of heat um, that, uh, that's getting created is going to then change into the different type of bacteria. So shelter for the team. Uh, there are so many options out there. And this was um, just taking a stroll around the Scottsdale Community College, uh, looking at some different examples. And um, what I loved was that there, all the homemade uh, compost bins and the, you know, the recycled, recycled bins, the repurposed recycled bins, that's awesome. And then, you know, the, the tumblers, the store-bought tumblers, but then you also see here, here's a made, a homemade tumbler, okay? Same kind of um, concept, you're on the tumblers, those are gonna be an enclosed bin, they're off the ground, and then you're gonna feed your material into the bin and you can rotate it, hence the tumbler, so that's where your aeration is going to happen on a tumbler. So when you get to the point of asking your question, do I want to manually turn my compost by a pitchfork or do I want to turn a handle uh, or turn over a bin, for example? So things to be thinking of, what type of shelter you want for your team. Uh, let's see. So here is the recycle bin. This is an older one um, with the holes cut in. So this is for aeration. So that's important. Okay. And then here's the blue one. And this blue one is, it, when uh, Joanne showed me the, the picture of the, the recycle bin from Glendale, it, the shape of it reminded me of this uh, blue one that I saw, and also that uh, the green one too, and it's more of a cone shape, okay? So if you notice on this one, the lid has been removed from the compost bin, okay? So the lid used to be on the top. Well, the shape of that bin is cone shaped. So if we leave it shaped like that, and you try to pull that compost bin up and off of your compost, it's gonna be hard because the shape is gonna be like this. So if we change it and make the shape like that, then it's easy to pull off your compost. So my best advice there is um, take the lid off because that lid is good to have, but then take your bin and turn it upside down. So what used to be the bottom of the recycle bin is now the top, and the top of the recycle bin is now the bottom, but the lid you're now gonna place on the top, weight it down, you see, you know, here's a brick that's just weighted down so it doesn't um, fly away. But that's gonna help hold moisture in, um, it's gonna help to keep other um, rodents and things out, um, little pesky things if that's a, an issue. And um, so, but mainly it just helps to get that compost bin up and off of your compost. And that's what you see here in the green photo. So this green photo, or this green uh, bin here, that used to be sitting right on top of that compost. Okay. And then what she's done, she's now, now taken that off of that finished um, or almost finished compost, she's moved the bin over and started building a new pile in this bin. Well, this one is just finishing the conditioning, and then you can turn that and, and use that as well just to finish it up before it goes into the garden. And then, um, oh, also wanted to show on this blue bin. So when we get talking about how to build your compost, if you're building as you go, the finished compost is gonna be closer to the bottom. And that, uh, 
little flap, that little access port into the bottom of your compost is so you can get in there and scoop all that nice finished compost out if you're doing a build as you go type of uh, a bin. And then this one down here at the end, this is uh, creative. This is just using chicken wire um, wrapped, you know, created in a circle. So plenty of aeration on this setup here. I'd be concerned maybe a little too much aeration on this type because it's so exposed. Um, it, it might dry out a little bit faster than say within the bends, okay? But that's not necessarily an issue. Just you need to add more water. You need to, to watch it. So, um, but when thinking about a shelter for your team, compost tumblers, enclosed bins, build your own bin. And that's what you see behind you here, this background photo, that's, uh, that's com uh, old pallets that are made into a, a compost bin. Okay. And that's another thing, I, I like to look into waste streams. Um, what can you make that's going to be a repurpose? So definitely those recycle bins, I love that idea. But what else can you use? Do you have old pallets around? Do you have another you know, 50 gallon drum that you can make into a, a bin, a tumbler? So get creative with that, tap into those waste streams. And then how to choose the right one for you and your team, okay? So this is gonna get down to where do you live? Are you in, a, are you in an urban setting, um, so suburban setting, rural setting? So you know, how much space do you have? Where's your neighbors? Um, what will you be composting? So this can get into um, you know, the size of material, um, how much space are you gonna need? Which is, uh, you know, thinking of that last bullet item there. Because, um, and then do you wanna turn manually? And that turn manual means, do you wanna do a tumbler, you know, rotate the barrel? Do you want to use a pitchfork? You're gonna have to turn, you're gonna have to aerate your compost. And so, um, but definitely that, that space, because if you're building compost, if you're doing a batch method, then you're gonna store all your, your um, composting material, you're gonna store that somewhere, then on the day it's to make my batch compost, then you're gonna use all that material, but you gotta store it somewhere first, you know, in five gallon buckets or you know, the dry stuff, you might be just leaving it in a pile, but uh, do you have space for that? So where do you think about where you live, what you'll be composting and do you have the space for it? And then how are you gonna turn that compost? Okay, where do we site that shelter? You know, where's the right location for it? Well, we want it close to the house, but not too close. Um, you know, the things that are, uh, that are gonna be attracted to the, the compost, you know, you might get some, you might get some roaches, some other little bugs there, you know, that, that higher uh, <laughs> third level. So we don't want those in our home. So setting them a little bit away from the home is good. Um, some rule of thumb is, you know, 10 feet, but just having it uh, so it's not right against your house. And then um, you're going to have to have a water source, either somewhere, you know, it's e it'd be easier if you could have a hose uh, that you can use with a, um, a spray attachment. Um, but if not, you know, you can use buckets of water, there's got to be a water source somewhere because you're going to have to give your compost water. And then the sun, here in our climate, our compost doesn't really need our hot desert sun. The hot desert sun is just going to dry our compost out quicker. It's not uh, that it's the benefit for the heat, the compost is gonna generate its own heat. So partial shade is actually a little bit better, or you know, it can even be more shade because just to help um, so our compost doesn't get um, too dried out too quick. And then if you're gonna place your compost on say a concrete or on a deck, definitely those tumblers would be a good solution because it doesn't touch that decking material or the concrete. Um, so it's got to, it should have a bottom on it because if you don't, what's going to happen is, um, especially if it's a wood decking, well, that, uh, that team is going to start eating into your wood deck um, and it can stain your, your concrete. And so if it's on those kind of surfaces, a closed bottom is good. If, if it's on, if you have bare soil that you can put it on, I personally think that's the best thing to do because I like to have my compost touch the soil so that way any soil life, it can go up and down too. 
if you're going to create a new garden somewhere and you're, and you're like, oh, this is where I want my garden space. Well, that would be a good spot to start a compost pile. Let it do its thing. Let that um, nutrients leach down into the soil. And then when that's done, you can move that off and then condition and get your garden bed ready. So um, adequate air area for building, turning, and possibly stockpiling. This is important because if, if you have a really tiny space, but you can't get in there and, and turn it you know, with the pitchfork over to the other pile or get in there and move it around, it's going to be very complicated. And it's going to be um, a chore and hard to do. And then things are going to, um, you might not be as interested in. So find that right spot where you have enough space for that turning and building. And then how are you going to access your compost? Are you just going to grab it with buckets? Do you need room for a wheelbarrow to come through? So how much space? And then uh, definitely keep it away from any wood structures that you don't want, um, well, possibly getting some, uh, um, <laughs> some decomposing on that wood structure material. So thinking about those right locations. Um, it's also, where are you creating your resource material? So if you have a, an area like close to your garden and that's where most of your resources is coming from, maybe your compost bin makes more sense to be close to that. Um, if you have chickens and you have a space for your compost and you're, you're composting their chicken, um, their chicken bedding and manure, maybe that's you know, closer there. Um, so having it uh, easily accessible, is is always good because uh, if it's if it's hard and if it's a challenge and it's raining outside, I might not go out there and, and put what I need onto the compost. This is my story when thinking about where to site the compost. And uh, this, uh, as you see, that that corner of our compost area is right back here. This is our southeast corner wall of our backyard. And so what I did is I. I used a compost, um, I made a compost bin out of some pallets and then I, I got some other, I found an old lid off of, a, um, off of a dumpster that was on the side of the road. So I repurposed that and then I used uh, some uh, pizza boxes to help separate two things um, because of that space and the triangle shape. The thing I didn't like about the, the location, I love it for, you know, easily accessible. I've got place for storing my, my tools. I got places for stockpiling, but I can see it when I walk out the door and um, my compost area doesn't always look prim and proper, but as far as a visual and aesthetics, I knew I was going to want to help hide it by planting something in the location right here that would screen it. And so I'd want to have it screened all year round. So I was thinking a tree that doesn't drop its leaves. I, um, I also use some, um, you know, uh, for this, this space, there's a water harvesting basin right in this location. And so what we ended up doing was planting a citrus tree. So the citrus tree now grown in blocks the view of the compost. And I still have plenty of room of getting back. It also hides uh, the other area where I'm um, stockpiling some, uh, some dry material. So you might be able to start out by creating a, in one location, but it visually it's like, well, I just wish I didn't have to see it. Then think about how you can plant, um, provide screening uh, to help cover that, that space up. Okay, so food for the team. This is, wow, the food for the team is kind of all over the board. Um, and really it gets down to what food do you have, what resources do you have to build compost? And, and this is just a, a small list. Uh, definitely when you start um, looking through your whole household resources, if it's not on this list, definitely go ahead and you know, Google it. There's lots of lists on composting, uh, what should or should not go in. And, um, but the things definitely, you, if you are gardening, then you should be composting your garden waste and your yard trimmings. So that, if you're um, composting your yard trimmings, branches, so if you're trimming down your trees, those are gonna be kind of hard to break down over time. So wood material, it's a very high in carbon. So for your, um, your tree branches and limbs, gosh, personally, I would love to have a, comp uh, a chipper shredder so I could just chip those branches up and then I could use it as mulch. 
So, and that's really a good use of our, our wood, um, you know, branches and things like that is to use it more as mulch. But your other yard trimmings, your smaller little branches and twigs and things like that, definitely for compost. Uh, kitchen scraps and fruit and vegetables, you know, we're, we're producing those. That used potting soil, I thought that was kind of interesting because, well, it doesn't mean that you're going to go out and buy potting soil to you know, put into your compost. But when you have a plant that just didn't, you know, didn't make it or um, what do you do with that soil? You could always put it into your compost. And coffee grounds is a big one. And uh, the coffee grounds it works as a nitrogen. And I have a story that I'll share about the coffee grounds in a bit. But uh, yeah, so definitely this list here, you know, we, we don't all have grass, but if you do, that could be very uh, good in nitrogen to add to your compost system, as long as it hasn't gone to seed, and we'll talk more detail. But uh, the different types of the manure, like chicken manure, if you have chickens, that's great for the compost. And, and definitely if you have chickens, you should be composting one way or another, because the, I know the chickens are creating a material that's great for your garden. So, um, so that, that shouldn't be bagged up and throw away, that should be used as a resource. Um, and then if you are composting eggshells, that, that's great. Um, you know, if you wash them out, so that way um, they're less uh, to attract any other kind of insects. Um, but the, the napkins and paper towels, this is a little, uh, when I started composting, back in, um, so 2005 is when we started our first composting small little bin. And uh, I started uh, collecting all my napkins from when I'd go out to, to eat. If it was a paper napkin, I'd put it in my pocket when I was done because it's going to my compost when I get home. And I got in such a habit with that, I came home one afternoon <laughs> and I had a linen uh, napkin in my pocket and uh, my wife teased me about that but it was such a habit i just put it in my pocket so um definitely the paper napkins those are good to put into your, your compost um, when we're talking about paper too paper is going to be higher in carbon so that shredded newspaper and cardboard that's great for our gardens but we just or our compost but we want to keep in mind that that nitrogen ratio mix carbon nitrogen ratio um, and that getting into that hay and straw too. So for example, for our chickens, what we do is we use a, an alfalfa hay for their chicken run. And the chickens love all those little alfalfa leaves, but they don't eat much of the straw. They'll, they'll break it down, but they don't really eat too much of it. So what I get is some little pieces of alfalfa straw that's been dried out you know, over a little bit of time. So it's turning more into carbon. And uh, that material is great for the compost. But if you're um, adding that material, you might find you don't have enough nitrogen. And that's exactly what we ran into. And so it's just my wife and I that we were building our compost and uh, gosh, I, it was either it was too, too much, uh, uh, too wet or too smelly. And it, so I'd be looking for more browns and then put that in and where am I finding the browns? And then when we uh, started doing the composting of the chicken bedding, then it really got to the point where we needed more, something to break that up. And the coffee shop down the road, so this is back in 2010, April of 2010, just opened up. And that was a vacant building for almost three years. And I was really excited to see something show up. And that it was a coffee shop. So I showed up uh, with my five gallon bucket, met the owner and said, I'd love to start composting your coffee grounds because um, we'd done some other composting for other small little restaurants too. And it was kind of dabbling in that. And, and definitely um, coffee grounds is easier to, to compost than say a small little restaurant's uh, food waste. But those coffee grounds, uh, he said, well, Ryan, we have a plan to do a, a large scale you know, composting program, but let's give it a shot. And, uh, and I didn't know if I was going to be able to compost all the coffee grounds that that little coffee shop was going to make. But I ended up uh, giving them a six five-gallon buckets that they could put underneath the, their, um, their place where they have to store and they're making coffee and then dumping the coffee grounds. And in one week, they would fill up five to six of those coffee uh, five-gallon buckets. And that... Uh, <sighs> Wow, that's a lot of coffee grounds. And in, in coffee grounds, you typically could just pour right onto your garden, okay? Because of, um, uh, you know, they're a lower, like a 20 to one um, mix, but you could just use them as a top, you know, basically mulch. 
And uh, every pour at this particular coffee shop has a filter. So every pour of coffee has a filter. And this five gallon bucket was full of coffee grounds and paper filters. I couldn't just pour that onto our garden bed because of all those paper filters. So what I did is I poured it onto our, my compost pile. And that's when I found the amazing thing that coffee grounds did to that straw. It just basically turned it into what it kind of looked like ash, if it, but it, you know, it wasn't, but it, it just broke it down within about a week or two of turning and getting it. So my, uh, my message to that is if you're short on one type of resource, find where you can tap into that resource. So if you're short on browns, figure out where you can find those browns. If you're short on greens, figure out where you can find those greens. Okay. And so uh, this is also, as I mentioned, uh, if we have chickens. And when we got the chickens, that changed our, uh, our whole composting program altogether. Because what we were taking, all our food scraps, everything was going right out to the compost bin. And, but now, what they, so what we do is we actually separate. So we separate our, um, gosh, I'm gonna stop sharing this screen for a moment. Okay, I don't know if you can see me a little bit larger by doing that, but I, I wanna show you something. So, so this is an old, um, it was an ice, like an ice bucket that, um, that my wife found, I think at a yard sale or something like that. Um, but it came with it, like a little plastic insert and this nice little lid. And this is what um, we would store all our, our kitchen. So what we're producing in the kitchen, I'd put it in this and then you know, leave it in here for a few days before taking it out to the compost. So I could build this up. But what would happen is if I just put raw material in there and put the lid on, every time I'd open it up, it'd get kind of smelly. So, by using shredded paper, then I put the shredded paper, put a bottom layer in there. And now if I put in my, um, so things that don't go to the chickens is like our onion tops, um, eggshells, because yep, um, the coffee grounds will go in here. And so that extra newspaper is gonna help with the smell while I'm waiting to build up this bin before I take it outside. And then also too, you could put like a little newspaper on top of the lid and that's gonna help it. Um, over time, this little thing started getting some moisture and started rusting out. And so my wife's gonna redo this one. And uh, uh, so lately I just been using this little, um, uh, you know, it's about 32 ounces and uh, or 64 ounce little container, something that I can just put on the shelf. So, when I'm cutting up uh, things, I can put it in there. I'm not rushing right out to the compost bin. Okay. So having that little staging area is good. And then let me go ahead and share the screen. So now what we do because of the chickens, it's, uh, we don't put those apples in that bin anymore. We have a little bowl that sits next to the bin and that bowl goes out to the chickens every day. So I don't put paper in that. Um, but it collects that material of all the things that the chickens are going to eat, which, uh, <laughs> wow, they, uh, you know, there's certain food scraps that uh, we don't feed to the chickens, um, but, uh, and then, you know, we don't feed them their, their eggshells, um, but all the, a lot of the other stuff, so our apple pills, um, shredded carrots, well, basically all our vegetable scraps go to the, the chickens first, and this was important. When, um, when I was taking our perma, uh, the permaculture design course and thinking about the whole integrated system, I knew I wanted a garden and I, I didn't really know if I wanted chickens or not. I mean, I, I was raised on a small little farm in, in southeastern Idaho and very familiar with farm animals. I thought, well, we live in you know, the city here. And so, uh, but the more I thought about the process, and how the chickens completed my composting cycle. Okay, so for example, we feed the chickens, we care for them. Those chickens are gonna eat the food that we're feeding them and they're gonna give us eggs and they give us those nice rich, nitrogen rich pellets that then feed the compost. 
And so that's going to go into our compost pile. Those decomposers, uh, my, my composting team in there, they're doing all that work and they're going to make me compost. Now that compost is going to feed my garden and that garden's going to feed me. And then I'm going to feed the chickens. The chicken's going to feed the compost. The compost feeds the garden. The garden feeds me. And we just go round and round and around. And it completes that cycle. So for me, that made a lot of sense. But by all means, chickens are not for everyone. It just helped to make that, um, that connection for me. It also helped to make the connection for not wanting to use any chemical fertilizers. So all the fertilizers we use for our garden is our compost and um, the chicken manure. So think about those resources that you have and how can you tap into the waste streams and complete those cycles. So things that we just, we want to avoid feeding our team is uh, uh, coal and charcoal ash. So that's not because of the way that they make it, some of the things that are in it, um, just not good for our compost. Large quantities of acid materials. So, okay, citrus. Can I compost citrus pills? Well, that depends. It depends on how many citrus pills are you talking about? Is it going to be too much for your compost bin and those little critters aren't going to be happy? Or is it a, a pill or two? And, and how big of those pieces? Are they smaller? So, um, but we definitely don't want to overload it with a whole bunch of acidic material. Um, pet waste. So pet waste, don't put into your compost that you're going to use for your garden. You can still compost your pet waste, but you want to do it separately. And there's a different method for that. And, uh, and then you can use that compost on your ornamentals, but not for your food garden because of what could still be left in um, the compost that might not be healthy from us, you know, from the pets. But um, if you do have pets and you're interested in that, look into other composting solutions for your pet waste, but use it on ornamentals. And the hard to kill weeds and weeds that have gone to seed, definitely, um, this is a tough one because if it hasn't gone to seed, that would be a very viable plant to put into the compost bin. Unless it's like vine weed or some type of weed that's just really hard to kill. And I put Bermuda in that list there because Bermuda is hard to kill. Now Bermuda, unless it's gone to seed and it's, you know, and it's been um, cut at a regular, regular level and it's those little um, uh, grass clippings, now that's, that's fine. Um, I still get a little nervous when it comes to composting Bermuda, but uh, my garden neighbor, Jim, he, that with, with that double tumbler, he loves it. That's what he saw. He puts uh, leaves and um, grass clippings and some other material. And, and he says within three weeks, he can get good compost. So, you know, um, also too, no dairy products, fats, greases, lards, meats. Those are all things that are going to attract um, the, the pests that we don't want. Okay. So it's good to avoid those in your compost. Um, it's, it's, not that your comp it's not that composting couldn't take care of those items. They could, but in our little urban setting compost, um, those type of products, they're gonna attract, um, could attract rats, uh, dogs, you know, different things that, um, that it's just not good to do. So those are the items that we are to avoid from feeding our compost. And then, how to create that balanced diet for, for those little, uh, for that team. So this is where it's going to get a little technical. Okay. And I don't want you to get um, too overwhelmed with these numbers because remember back to what I first said, this is like cooking. You got a recipe, you have your own ingredients and you're making that compost. So you're going to have carbon. Carbon is energy for those uh, decomposers. Carbon is your brown. Nitrogen, that's that protein for those decomposers, and that's going to be your greens. Not necessarily in color, because coffee grounds, what color is it? Yeah, it's brown, so it's not green. So don't be misled by that. You have to understand how much carbon to nitrogen ratio each of those materials have. And that perfect uh, kind of balanced diet is going to be between 20 and 40. Um, some say, really, 20 is better. Um, especially for that batch um, uh, method for composting, breaking down. For more of that add as you go, you're going to be higher. You're going to be probably close to that 40 to maybe even 50 to 1. Okay. So let's do the math. So when cal well, let me step back for a minute. So when calculating, so for example, each of the items here have 
a carbon to nitrogen ratio. Notice that all the ones here that are nitrogen are below 30 to, 30 to 1. The browns are, are above 30 to 1, just kind of a, just as to separate those. So now if I'm collecting material, and let's just say I'm going to use a batch method, and I'm, I'm collecting all that material, and I'm going to make that, that pile. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if my carbon to nitrogen ratio is within that perfect balanced diet. And so I'm going to take, for example, one part general garden waste, which was 30 to one carbon. So that's, that's 30. So there's a, a, a bucket of that. One part vegetable scraps. Okay, that's 25 to one. So that's 25 that we're going to use to add. Bucket of that. I'm going to throw a bucket of chicken manure, which is 15 to one, and then a bucket of dry leaves. So roughly around 50 to one. If you notice the leaves were anywhere from 30 to 80, well, it depends if they're um, fresh leaves or if they've been dried or, and then what type of leaf they are. But now we got our, our ingredients. Our, let's see if our ratio matches up for a perfect balanced diet. So you're gonna calculate, you're gonna take 30 plus 25 plus 15 plus 50. So you're adding up all the carbon here. And that equals 120. Well, there was four parts, so I'm gonna divide that 120 and I get 30. Okay, so for this mix, I have a balanced diet of 30 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. Now, what, okay, so this is a scenario where it's five gallon buckets, these are all one parts. That worked out well, but what if I have sawdust and sawdust was 500 to one? Would I put a whole five gallon bucket? Nope, I, I couldn't. That would just blow my carbon to nitrogen ratio way off. I would want to use a smaller amount of that material. So here it'd be say one gallon versus five gallons of material. So one gallon of sawdust versus the five gallons. So that one gallon is gonna break it down to carbon to nitrogen ratio. It's still 500, but it's less material for the overall material that you're, you're adding. So when thinking about that, that's the same with all our higher, uh, let me get back to that. So for all our higher carbon materials, this newspaper cardboard, you're not gonna put a five gallon bucket of that newspaper in on top of um, a, uh, a five gallon bucket of food scraps. It depends. Depends if you're doing a batch method or a, um, build as you go. So let's talk about that. Okay, so the build as you go um, or add as you go method. This is where you're gonna just start a pile and you're taking your greens and you're gonna take your browns and you're gonna create that pile. You're gonna just add new material to the top. Okay, so you're adding that new material to the top. And when you do that, especially, okay, say it's uh, my little, uh, it's got a little compost bin that has my material in it. Okay, here's got some greens and some browns, but also got that layer of, yep, shredded paper. So when I dump this on to the garden or onto the compost, um, that little carbon is also gonna help with the nitrogen material. And then we're adding to that pile. If I didn't add a little bit of carbon on top, a little bit of brown on top, I definitely wanna dig a hole. And, and I, I, I personally prefer, I dig a little hole in my uh, top of the compost and I put my new material in and then I just cover it right back over. And that's important because we don't wanna have any fresh material sitting right on top. If we have fresh material sitting on top, then that's gonna attract flies. And um, you know, we don't wanna have those little pesky things. So um, covering all your material is important and covering it with a brown, a carbon, so that way the nitrogen rich isn't on top. And then maintaining that, uh, that perfect moisture level. This one's really, um, oh gosh, hard to explain. You know that, that, that wrung out sponge, that fill? Was that throughout your whole compost? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to keep it moist. You don't want it to be completely dried out to where there's no moisture, but you don't want it wet, where it's, you know, it's just got a lot of, you know, where it's just starting to drip out. Um, that's a problem. So you don't want it too wet. You don't want it too dry. You want it just right in the middle. And that takes a little bit of work. And you might find that, oh, it got too dry on me. So don't panic. 
just give it some more water and then give it some air because you're going to want to give it air. If you don't, it's going to get matted. It's going to dry out. Um, and you're going to either go anaerobic or it's just not going to do anything. And so uh, mixing up that pile, you got a couple options. You got a pitchfork, compost crank, you know, tumbler. How are you going to mix it up? And then that finished compost can be found at the bottom of the pile. And that's what I was saying in that one blue bin that showed, uh, had that little trap door in the bottom. So if you're just building on the top, you're building, building, building at the top, the top, at the bottom, this is where that finished compost will be. Okay, so definitely a good way. This is actually the majority of, uh, I mean, this is how I compost and the majority of the composters that, I see, that I've been seeing around, this is the typical method. Your other method is build it, you know, doing that batch method. So you're going to collect all the material for the day when you're going to create that batch of compost. And this is exciting because you got all this material, you got your carbon to nitrogen ratios figured out, and you're going to start building the, the pile with the, the greens and the browns. But first, you're going to add a little bit of coarse material on the bottom. And that coarse material on the bottom is going to help um, with a little bit of the aeration. It's also going to help um, so that way, uh, when you go, so with the compost, it just kind of keeps it up a little bit. But uh, if you, um, a little caution there, if you use too big a sticks on the bottom of your compost, when you go to turn it, that it could be problematic. So, but putting a, a coarse material on the bottom is good. And then you're gonna add those green and browns. Um, typically people just add them alternating layers, put in a two, three inches of green, a couple inches of brown, you're watering in between, of course. But you may find that mixing those materials together first. So instead of just doing them in layers, combine them all up, mix them together, and then build your pile. So put in you know, so much, then wet it down. Put in so much more and wet it down. So a couple ways. You just layer it up, or you mix those green and browns together, and then you put it into the, into the composter. So uh, adding that scoop of finished compost. So if this is um, a never been composting in this uh, pile, it should, it could use an activator, something that's got some beneficial microbes in it that's right in our soil. So put a scoop of that native soil into your, uh, in between each layer, that would be good. Um, you could use finished compost. So what you're doing is you're just adding in some, basically some, you're adding a little team already into the system. Okay. But be sure to moisten that, that each layer as we've been talking about and you gotta you gotta aerate it and uh, when when aerating so you may find okay i've built up this pile it's as big as it's going to be and and i'm aerating but i'd like to create a new pile now keep in mind this is a pile that you're not adding as you go so that you've built this pile this is in your bin and you're ready to build another bin you got all your stockpiles everything that you have you can take the material out of the first bin, put it into a second bin for like a conditioning um, phase or finishing phase, and then start building your, your new batch into the main composting bin. So ways of uh, breaking to get uh, making more compost is having additional piles. So provide that air for the team. Okay. This is, uh, I like to think it's exercise. I, I personally, this is where I can get a little lazy. I, I am a lazy composter, I'll admit it. So I like those decomposers to do the work and I do give them some love, maybe not as often as I should. Summertime is really hard, um, you know, out there in the heat and keeping it dry or moist, it gets dried out. And so, um, but turning it, adding moisture is good. And when you turn it, I like to have an easy method of turning. And so um, the, the photo there, that's a compost crank. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute and grab some more props. Okay. So this, uh, this tool, which is called a mulching fork. Okay, a mulching fork. It's got 10 tines to it. This is what I used to use for turning compost. And I love it. It's great. I, I love this for use <laughs> for spreading mulch. Um, it works a lot better than a, a shovel for scooping out finished mulch and, and compost, unless it's too fine and then a, a real fine compost is gonna fall through that. But for turning your compost pile, this works really well. I like it better than a shovel. 
I also like it also like it better than a digging fork because a digging fork it, it's kind of short and um, it's just kind of straight handle and it's just ergonomically it just doesn't feel right for turning compost with that so um, instead of a digging fork I like a, a mulching fork versus a pitch fork which has five times anyway my preference on uh, that that was my my preferred until I found this compost crank from low tech products out of Tucson and there are other cranks out there too. So, the, but the method, the, the idea of this crank, just it's like, wow, that is so much easier than going out and turning. Because what I do is I just crank down into the compost and then I pull it up and I crank down in another spot. And I'm gonna pull it up and I crank down another spot and I pull it up and I can go in and get those corners and I pull it up and it's pulling up you can see that's about a three inch diameter is pulling up these um, cores of compost from the bottom up to the top and it's just mixing it pretty thorough and that saves me from turning the pile and I like that and it works really well and it works really well for those composting bins those recycled uh, composting bins because they're that round circle you could just go in there and you could go out you could do it every day just give it a little bit of air or once a week would be good but give it some air okay and then let's see share the screen and so uh, there again too when i mentioned you're giving it air but you've got your pile um, if you have room for a second pile that's also good and that's what i do i, I use a, a build pile and then i turn it over to the second pile and then I turn it over to the third pile and that's basically the finished compost. So you got to keep them hydrated. Got to keep that team, uh, get plenty of water, not too much water, just that right amount. That's why I said it's good to site your compost bin where a water source is. And, uh, you know, using a bucket on your compost, that's definitely a, a good solution. This was actually uh, from the shower, you know, that, that five minutes uh, wait for the water to warm up. That's that bucket that helped capture that water instead of going down the drain. Well, it goes on the, on the compost bed. But using a spray, uh, spray handle, that would be good, um, you know, to get a good, nice mix. Some, uh, I've seen some people get creative and, and install a irrigation valve and a timer and then a micro spray and when it's you know they got it set onto a schedule throughout the year for the basically the, the evaporation and how often it comes on and how moist that needs to be and it sprays that compost so i also like personally i like to aerate and water at the same time if needed and so when i aerate i'm checking my moisture if it seems dry then i go ahead and water it if it doesn't then i wait if um, also too, what I like to do is I like to water and then aerate some more, which is going to get that moisture further down and I'm mixing that material up. So uh, with that uh, compost crank, I like to water and aerate pretty much kind of as I go to get a good mix. But definitely give that team some water. Things you're going to want to keep in mind. It's those small pieces. Uh, wow. Another uh, permaculture uh, principle, uh, beneficial edges. That one was, um, it's like, hmm, what does this mean, beneficial edges? Until I started opening my eyes and seeing the beneficial edges everywhere. Like for example, that, that edging between the, the walkway and the, um, my, uh, my landscape area, that's typically gathering more moisture. So if I do have weeds or volunteer plants that pop up, it's usually right on those edge. That's, that's where I get my marigolds popping up, is right at the edge of the concrete sidewalk in the landscape, because that little extra moisture, beneficial edges, they're all around us. And the smaller that we you know, cut up our pieces of material, we're creating more, more and more edges for those little uh, uh, decomposers to access and get on and to eat and to break down. So the smaller the pieces, the better. And uh, this is where, you know, put a little bit of time and a little bit of labor in, in, in cutting down and, and um, cutting those pieces into smaller pieces. 
that much your content. I think I've already kind of hit that at home, but uh, that's that 40 to 65% damp wrung out sponge. Uh, those leaves and grass clippings, they're great. Um, they're again, I'm a little hesitant on Bermuda, but as long as it hasn't gone to seed, uh, sprinkle them in, but mix them in with other materials. And that's um, like, you know, for example, leaves. You can mix your leaves in with those, um, those clippings and that bulk um, of the leaves and other material is going to help break up the grass clippings so they don't get matted. If the grass clippings get matted, then we're going to have a problem with the anaerobic. We're wanting to promote aerobic composting, not anaerobic. So we want air. We don't want the stinky anaerobic, which is going to be from matting, too much moisture. Um, so to uh, activate your new compost, as I mentioned, put on some native soil or maybe some finished compost. Definitely cover that material. Um, does the pile stink? Okay, so there's some troubleshooting here. So if the pile stinks for whatever reason, um, it may be maybe you added something in it you weren't supposed to add in. That could be causing the smell. Um, likely it's just got too much nitrogen or too much water. So you're gonna aerate it and you're gonna add some brown, you're gonna add some carbon. Um, if it's soggy, same scenario, you're gonna add some air because it's just too wet and you're gonna add some carbon. What you're doing is those, those microbes that are eating the material, they, they can only take in so much carbon and so much nitrogen. And once they've taken that in, the excess nitrogen is gonna off gas. And that's where we're getting that stinky smell is when, we're, when that's off gassing. Um, if the compost is too dry, and this is, <laughs> I'm guilty of this one, just because of our climate, I got busy, I didn't get out there and, and watered it, it dried out on me. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna add water. I might add a little bit more nitrogen too to help kind of kickstart it and go in again, okay? But also keep in mind what resources that you have. And uh, I'd really like to just hit this one home because um, if we can tap into our own personal resources for the material for our compost, then we're definitely doing a benefit for the environment. And, uh, and as I mentioned, if you don't have the resources and you have a goal for creating compost and you need a certain amount of compost and you have the space for it, tap into your resources and, and, uh, and use that uh, waste stream so that way it doesn't go out to the landfill. And why this is on here, if I didn't mention before, uh, yeah, the hair. Careful with those uh, tribbles. Um, okay. So I'm bringing in material from an outside source. You might find material in your compost that you didn't intend and it didn't break down. So material like plastic, glass, metal, it, it's not going to compost very well at all. It's going to be there. <laughs> and so don't be too surprised if this is like a little uh, milk container top thing. So periodically that's um, the coffee shop, you know, some of that would end up in it. So I pull that out. And then the other thing I love about this photo is I don't know how long that peach bit has been in my compost, but it just seems to always stay. And uh, so certain things are not going to break down very fast. Like, uh, Corn on the, you know, the, the cob of corn on the cob, those cobs take forever to break down, but eventually they do. So um, just the, not the plastic stuff, but the, the organic material. If it doesn't compost down, go ahead and put it into your, um, your, your building bin, your, your building compost pile and let it go through the process again and just kind of keep at that. Here again, finding your right recipe, shredding those materials, try not to overdo it. Um, uh, this could, if it's too stinky, you smelly, you might overreact and then throw in too much carbon. Um, so just be careful with that. Try to get the right ratio. Okay, how long will it take? Oh boy, this is a, a big, it depends. It depends on lots of scenarios. Um, one, you know, particle size, the, how, how often are you turning it? Um, how often are you watering? What's the, what's that temperature getting to? And is it getting up to 160? Um, if it is, great. But if it's getting over 160, it should be turned. But it's that carbon to nitrogen ratio. Okay. So it definitely can take a few weeks. Um, it could take a year. Some, I know people that uh, they just keep composting. Um, actually, they never 
they just keep adding to the top. They'll stir it sometimes, but it just, they always keep just harvesting from the bottom. And, uh, but two, how are you gonna use your compost? Are you gonna use it as a top mulch? Because if so, you could cheat a little bit and, and not have it completely finished as a top mulch. But if you're gonna mend it into the soil, you definitely want it composted because you want that to be, um, you know, completely gone through the process to get to that nice, you know, rich humus, you know, humus stage, the 10 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio, that's where that's at. But you're gonna smell it, you know, look to see, does it have that good earthy smell to it? Um, you're likely still gonna see some particles but um, what you don't want to see is any you know, big raw material in there. So that should get out and, and back into the next compost bin. But um, uh, definitely if you want to screen your compost pile or screen your compost, you can. And I did it first and it looked amazing. Just, it's beautiful. <laughs> I think I even took some photos of it at that time, but I couldn't find them for this presentation. However, it was a lot of work. And I learned after a while for just composting onto my garden, I didn't need to go through that extra process of, of screening it. I just put the material on. And if it's got a little more chunky uh, wood particles, with our clay soil and mixing and blending, as long as it's been you know, composted, getting started to break down, some of that's actually adding air pockets and it's, it's, it's good in, in, the soil, in moderation. However, um, if you do want to uh, screen, if, for example, if you're going to do any, um, do anything for like potting soil, it'd be good to kind of screen it, clean it up for that. Okay, so how are you going to use your compost? Well, you can till it into the ground and, uh, you know, most tillers are going to be, oh, about six inch or so of um, tines to till into that soil. Um, you know, if you do that, I, I personally, I like to till when we are making a new compost, um, I'm sorry, a new garden bed for the first time. If it's never been gardened in, the soil has been compacted, that's when I really like to loosen it up, get my organic material in, and then I don't like to till anymore after that, or at least um, not as often. And so once I get my garden bed, um, so that way I'm not, um, you know, tilling I'm, and I don't, I don't dig and, and rock the, the world of those little microbes by flipping them over. So because that soil web's getting created by the compost that you're adding. And once we get that soil web, I don't want to disrupt it because it's happy and it's doing its thing. So if I'm tilling a lot and I'm, and I'm or overturning it, then I'm disrupting that world. They're going to have to get resettled again. So um, what I like to do now is once it's, um, uh, I will, so it's a garden bed that I've been gardening for a while. It's not a fresh new one that I'm turning over. It's, I take a, a fork that's got four prongs, you know, the, the digging fork. I move it around a little bit. So I'm just creating little holes in the soil. And then I put compost on it water it in. That compost is going to seek down through those holes. That's going to help get it into a little bit lower that profile without disrupting the whole world of those, um, the microbes that are in your, your food soil. Uh, I'm sorry, your soil web. So the, um, <laughs> the easiest method is just add it as a top layer. Just add as mulch and water it in. Um, uh, you know, for compost tea, which, you know, we're not covering today, but compost tea is basically your seeping compost, um, you know, aeration to keep those, uh, keep the, the bacteria alive. Um, and then you, you foliate or you pour it onto the soil. Well, you could do the same by just laying out compost and watering it, let it leach into the soil. And using compost as mulch is a good thing. I use some um, compost on our garden. So compost goes into the garden bed, but wood chip mulch, I don't mulch inside the garden bed. I leave the wood chip mulch for the pathways. And the reason for that is because the gardens, the veggies like more of a, a mulch that's broken down with bacteria, where uh, wood is broken down with more of fungi. And so if I put wood in with my vegetables, I'm adding a carbon source that is going to take a little bit of the nitrogen from the surface level of the, of the soil. So it's kind of robbing that from the plant a little bit. Um, 
And, and it's just not the type of material that these soft tissues like. So what I do is I, comp I use uh, compost as mulch or I use the plants. And uh, so I'm not using all the plant waste as compost material. I let it dry and become as a mulch. So on certain plants and then some I, I uh, compost. But what I do with those coffee grounds, so composting six five gallon buckets a week is a lot of compost for over 10 years. So I compost some to help with our uh, compost, get that going. But what I do is I make windrows. This is the road, this is where we walk, this is our pathway. And so I put down mulch or the, the coffee grounds and then I put the wood chip mulch on top of that. So it's a thin layer of wood chip mulch. So what we have is that nitrogen in the, the coffee grounds is on the soil. Then the wood chip mulch goes on top of that. And then I walk on it, it's my pathway. Over time, that wood chip decomposes, breaks down, and the coffee grounds disappears. And that all leaches into the side of the edges of my garden. And when I, carrots, for some reason, that's the one I noticed the most. The best carrots I get is right off that edge. Go figure, beneficial edges, I don't know. <laughs> so different ways of using your material. If you're too much for composting, what are other ways you can use that material in the garden? And then if you've got too much material, what are you gonna do with it? Uh, you know, well, you're going to need to store it. How to properly store it? Well, to put it in a bin that still has some aeration, you know, that air can access, um, still needs to get some moisture. You know, you could put it in a bag, just make sure you put some holes in it, um, or just leave it right in your, say, if you're using a tumbler and you don't, and you have two of them, you store it in one, uh, use the other one for building. But, you know, find a good place to store it, or better yet, find a good place to use it and uh, put it underneath some plants. I love you for it. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, this is uh, definitely lots of information to share with you about composting. But uh, is there any questions that came out? Ryan, we do have some questions. So I'm going to start my video so folks can see me. Um, so I loved, um, before I go into the questions, I have to say I also really love the permaculture um, principles that you present. I think the edge one is fantastic. I always like to share that one of my favorite uh, permaculture principles is to start small and build on your success. And so I um, am teaching that to my son now because you can apply that principle to anything. So he's working on an Inca research project for school. And, you know, when you're first doing a research project and then having to write a poster, um, it's a lot of work, right? So I told them, you know, every day start small and just make, make yourself successful because if you do it the night before, it's not a good idea. So that's my favorite principle, but thank you for sharing the, the edge one. So Ryan, a lot of questions about, you know, what is compostable? So, you know, people were asking about the animal manures. Can you compost with pig manure? Can you compost um, with goat manure? Have, do you have experience with these? Yes, and so the, the one that's kind of that gray area was the pig manure, um, just because it, there's too many similarities. Um, but all the other manure is good manure, and it's the other one that, well, I should say, the other one that you might read about to avoid is the horse manure. And the horse manure is because of the way that their stomach that process the seeds. It, their concern is in the horse manure, you might get wheat seeds. However, um, that, that might depend. Depends on what they're eating. Um, I've seen um, weeds come through with other type of manures too. So, but as far as um, goat manure is good to use, uh, steer manure. Uh, I, I personally have used horse manure before because that's the resource that we have. Um, chicken manure for sure. Rabbit manure. Rabbits you can put right on to your garden. You don't even have to compost that. Um, but yeah, definitely tapping into the manure waste streams, but the pig was the one that I read that we, we have to be careful with. Okay, that's really good to know. Yeah, several people were asking about those manures. Um, pests. So someone wrote that they feel that their compost is breeding ants. Um, and then I know there's other pests too. So do you want to go over some, you know, pest prevention measures again? 
Yeah. So for pests, um, so those pests are actually, they might be part of your composting environment. However, if you got ants building, you know, a big nest in your compost, it, it, it tells me a couple of things. It's, um, you're creating an environment that's uh, more friendly to ants than you are for the, the decomposer. So you might be running a little dry on, on your compost. So um, aerate, mix it up and make sure that it's got the right amount of water and consistency. Yeah, and I was telling Ryan before the, the class tonight that um, I am a lazy composter. I heard Ryan say that, but you're probably not as lazy as I am. So um, I was able to get a bin from the city of Phoenix. So I am a Phoenix uh, a resident. And, um, you know, I was doing a really good job with composting, you know, all the kitchen scraps, neighbors were bringing their compostable materials over. It, it was doing really well. I didn't turn it, it got real dry. And who do you think was settling camp in my compost? A little family of mice. And I don't like mat mice, I don't like rodents. And so I had to get better about being a little less lazy and just stirring it more and just trying to keep it moist. So not wet, but I always tell people like, kind of like the consistency of a sponge. You don't want it dripping, but you also don't want it bone dry either. So you, you need those microbes uh, working and, and decomposing the materials. Um, so someone else was asking about these tribbles. So someone else commented that that's from Star Trek. <laughs> Enlighten me, Ryan. Yeah, yeah, that is from the Troubles with Tribbles. Uh, episode and uh, yeah those little furry creatures so uh, yeah it's composting um, the hair from the barber shop down the road and uh, you know hair is a nitrogen so it works great for composting but it takes forever to break down and I knew that going in but I didn't realize because you know, I was composting and when I shave I you know put the you know my my beard clippings and, and what little hair I have left. You know, I'll put that in there. But, um, but when I was seeing uh, my barber, this is going back a few years ago, and uh, I was telling her about my composting. And uh, she's like, oh, well, I, I give you a bag of hair now. And she gave me like a little, um, you know, grocery bag full of hair that she, you know, from the, the vacuum thing that she has. And, and uh, I was composting and, and um, for about three months, I was uh, adding some more hair and, and then I realized I got to stop doing that because it would clump up and it'd create this mat of hair and then all I'd have is these little, you know, my, my wife called them whoppets, but the tribbles, the little hairy uh, creatures that are in the compost bin and uh, I still find them every now and then. Yep. So that's the troubles with tribbles. If you're adding hair, um, make sure it's, um, you know, not, uh, you're not adding it into a big clump. Make sure it's really spread it out a lot. Because that was my mistake. I just kind of poured in that bag and kind of stirred it around a little bit. I didn't really break it up too much. Okay, that's, that's good to know. Um, and yeah, the questions are great, everybody. Keep them coming. So someone was dehydrating their kitchen scraps, and I wrote, I think it acts more like the brown material. Enlighten me. What do you think? So is it going to offset their carbon nitrogen if they're dehydrating their kitchen scraps? Yes. So the more that you're dehydrating, uh, you're taking out that moisture, the more carbon it's becoming. And so that's where um, if, uh, if you are nitrogen rich and you're kind of carbon poor, you can let some of your nitrogen material dry out and become carbon. You just lose some of that nitrogen, you know, part of the resource of it. But um, definitely where if your, your nitrogen, if your greens are turning brown, then it's going to work as a carbon. Okay, thanks, Ryan. That's good to know. Yeah, a lot of a lot of questions. What are these tribbles? It, it sounds like a really cool thing. Like I, I don't know. Let's, <laughs> no, just, I want a tribble. Why don't I have a tribble? Well, it's um, a Star Trek episode, so yeah, trouble with tribbles, and and yeah, right. there's a I'll be thing. ready for trivial pursuit next time. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, someone was asking about you know um, compost kind of getting a little funky. Uh, in the kitchen after a while and you know can you put it in your refrigerator I said yeah I mean put it in the fridge and I do that all the time with my leftovers um, so I would think it kind of helps mitigate the odor a little bit um, but I keep a, cont a steel container on my kitchen counter 
Um, and then I just put the scraps in, you know, eggshells, my coffee filters, you know, banana peels, all that stuff. And then I try and take it out like every two days because to my composter, because I start to get fruit flies and just kind of general stink. So what do you do, Ryan, to get the compost uh, out of your house? Yeah, well, so definitely every two days is, is good for that bin. But what I did was I added that um, shredded newspaper to the bottom of the bin. And then you can put a little bit on top too as you go. You're kind of adding some carbon. You're basically building a little, a little compost in your, your collecting bin. Um, but if you're getting you know, flies attracted to it, it, it's time to go out. And then you know, wash out the tail and then start over again. But uh, if, um, if you're putting it in the refrigerator, definitely. That's if you got room in your refrigerator. Um, we have a, a friends of ours, they'll freeze a lot of their scraps. <laughs> they give them to us, and then we unthumb them and we give them to our chickens first. But um, definitely, you can put that right into the compost if you're if you're freezing or refrigerating that material before. Um, it's just uh, if you've got space for it. If not, then I'd stage it outside. You can always do a five-gallon bucket outside if you're doing a batch pile. So basically, on that batch pile, you're collecting all your material for the day you're going to build it. Then create a five gallon bucket for so you're putting all your food scraps and stuff in that. Um, and if you take a, a newspaper, put that on the bucket and then put your lid on, that's going to help too with um, extra um, smell, kind of that uh, funk that you get. But it, uh, basically, if you're getting problems on the inside, it's time to take it outside. Great. And someone, just as you're, you were talking, Ryan, someone wrote, I put mine in the freezer in a bucket. Easy for me. So that's, that's yeah. really good feedback from everybody. Cool. Um, so a few more questions. Someone asked, should we be concerned about possible toxicity of ink in shredded paper? Oh, thank you for asking that question. Yeah. So the, a lot of our newspaper, the ink, the process has been switched to soy ink years ago. So your newspaper is going to be safe. It's those um, other type of ads you might get that, uh, and you see it has like a nice kind of glossy finish on. It just looks like um, it might not be soy ink. Avoid those. But our straight up newspapers, you know, the, the clippers that we get, those are going to be um, uh, printed with soy. So that, that's likely to be okay. Just avoid those uh, glossy kind of finished ones. That's really good to know. Yeah, and that's such a good question, you know, especially if we're growing our, our vegetables in, in our garden beds. Um, well, and it also makes me think, too, to add on to this. If you're shredding paper and you're using that shredded paper on your compost, don't shred the envelopes that have that little plastic uh, window to it. Yeah, I still find that little plastic in my compost. Yeah, so if you're going to use it on the compost, um, anything that's plastic, it's going to start showing up again. Um, so for example, like uh, Q-tips, uh, I compost those, but if it's the, you know, make sure it's the um, natural cardboard, basically, not a plastic uh, Q-tip. Anything that's plastic, metal, glass, you're going to find in your compost. That's good information, Ryan. Thank you. Um, many people are just saying that this was really detailed, more than they've ever heard. Um, thank you for hosting, Ryan. So uh, someone wrote that. Um, another person has a question. I prefer not to use manure. Is that okay? Ryan, I don't use manure. Um, I just use kitchen scraps, really. Um, I use, you know, I have eucalyptus trees, so I don't compost those, but I do have Palo Verde and some other um, trees and leaves that I do compost, but I don't compost the eucalyptus tree. And I don't use manure. I just use our kitchen scraps. Yeah, definitely. You don't have to bring in manure for your compost. So if you have that source, then it's a good source to use. Um, if you're trying to, you know, if you want to bump up some nitrogen in it, you know, it might be a good way too. But by all means, you don't have to bring in um, manure for your compost. It's just um, use the resources that you have and figure out the right carbon nitrogen ratio with those materials. Um, and you don't even really need to do the math if you just are patient and you're, you're observant because, um, uh, but if you do break down the math, it, it helps make that science sense out of it. All right. We've got two more questions uh, related to tumblers, um, the compost that kind of like Wheel of Fortune, you can kind of spin. Um, I actually have, have one of those. 
um, because I was having problems with my more stationary composter that was attracting mice. Um, but one person wrote, does a tumbler composting bin speed up the process? Ooh, does a tumbler composting bin speed up the process? It depends. It depends on how often are you tumbling it? Are you giving it the right amount of water? Do you have the right amount of carbon and, and, and nitrogen mix? So the tumbler is just a shelter. Um, it can make uh, compost just as fast as a, a, uh, a bin system. It's just uh, how often is it getting aerated? How much water in your carbon to nitrogen balanced diet? Yeah, and the compost, the tumbler, I like it because um, it's fun to spin. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's, you know, it's fun to spin. Um, and that was a barrier that I had before of being a lazy composter. So it's, when I put my uh, kitchen scraps and some of my yard scraps in, you know, I spin it and it, it's, it entertains me. Um, but I, I do have to keep it in the shade because it's, mine's black and it really absorbs the heat and the sun. So it's, it's underneath my pomegranate tree. And then um, every once in a while when we make pasta, I will bring the pasta water out and you know, put it in the compost bin and my, mine will actually drain the water. So the only challenge that I have with the tumbler is that it, I think it dries out a little bit quicker. Um, so it's a little, you know, it's some work, but it's, it's not that difficult. Um, so you're right, Ryan, it, you know, I, I share that same feeling that it, it kind of depends. Um, another question related to that, you know, the compost tumbler is, um, someone asked, should I add worms? I feel like there aren't a lot of little organisms in there yet. Yeah, no, no, just don't, don't add worms. Add in some other compost, a finished compost. Add in some native soil. So the worms, you, you may not find worms in your, in your compost. Um, they kind of got sensitive feet. So they're not, uh, you might find them on the outskirts or more in the cooler area. Like for worm, um, now worm composting, worm, you know, it's like if you're doing a band and it's just doing worm for their castings, that's a little different process. But um, to have in an aerobic um, compost, you wouldn't necessarily see earthworms. You may, but it's not, you may not. So um, I, I'm not, just because you don't have earthworms doesn't mean that you need to add them. But you may need to add some sort of uh, accelerator to what has basically inoculating your compost with some uh, beneficial microbes already. That's good. That's good. And uh, you're inspiring people, Ryan. Someone wrote really good presentation. I've tried composting with a rotating barrel and I just didn't have the ratios right and I was lazy. We've all been there and they wrote, want to give it a try again. So that's mm -hmm. awesome to hear. That, that just gives my heart some joy. Um, another person wrote, great class. I recently purchased a turning compost bin. I live in a residential area and I'm thrilled to learn more to keep my four raised beds and neighbors happy. Also, I'm a member of the Sun City Garden community, um, excuse me, Sun City Community Garden with a shared 10 by 20 foot plot with two people. Um, wow. I hope you have a very productive fall and winter garden. That's great. I love hearing these stories. Right. Um, I think that was the end of the questions. Again, just a lot of people very happy. And I think with the fall uh, approaching with us having the days where it'll be under 100 degrees this weekend, I think we're all gonna be out seeing each other at the big box stores or the small community uh, local nurseries. So that, that should be a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. It'd be, um, yeah, for all those who haven't, and this is your first time starting composting, it's a great time to get started. Um, you know, it, I, Watching your compost and taking on that, uh, you know, as far as uh, all those sourdough starters that uh, some of us had done over the, the summer, you know, we could be doing the same thing with our compost, getting compost and, uh, and, and watching and learning how to make compost and perfect that. And so I, I love that, to, uh, uh, that people are getting re-motivated again. And uh, it makes me feel really good to think that uh, so many people are interested in composting because composting it, is such a... Um, you know, to be able to take something that is considered dead and make it alive again. It, it's, um, I think compost is amazing. I, I've said before, I think compost will save the world. <laughs> That's awesome, Ryan. I can't think of a better way to end than compost is going to save the world. Ryan, <laughs> you're just, again, such an outstanding presenter. You're so passionate. You're, you're living, um, you, you talk the talk, you walk the walk. Um, so thank you so much. 
Um, thank you to the folks that are still on. Um, really appreciate everybody. If you guys weren't here, we wouldn't be here. So love having all of our attendees. Um, just a reminder, we will send out the survey. And again, we're giving away one uh, compost book. Um, and we want your feedback. What classes do you like? What did you like about this format? So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ryan. Good to see Welcome you. Welcome to Joanne. Thank you, everyone.